Welcome. We'll begin as, as we always do, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for coming uh, to this event on the judicial virtues. I'm Joel Alicea. I'm an assistant professor of law here at the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law and the co-director of the Project on Constitutional Originalism and the uh, Catholic Intellectual Tradition, CIT for short. Uh, we explore the relationship between the Catholic intellectual tradition and American constitutionalism more generally. And I think that that, uh, uh, that mission aligns very well with the topic of today's discussion, uh, the judicial virtues. We are very grateful for the co-sponsorship of the Institute for Human Ecology and uh, the Center for the Study of Statesmanship, both here at CUA, for their uh, support for this event. Uh, grateful for, for that. I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Solem first, and after his remarks, I'll then prof introduce Professor Green before his remarks. I'll facilitate a uh, conversation between them and then open it up for Q&A. Uh, from the general audience. So first, Professor Lawrence Solom is the William L. Matheson and Robert M. Morgenthau Distinguished Professor of Law, as well as the Douglas D. Drysdale Research Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. His scholarship focuses on constitutional theory, especially originalist theory, uh, procedure, and philosophy of law, and his work has been published in places like the Harvard Law Review, the University of Chicago Law Review, and the Virginia Law Review. His scholarship is particularly relevant to this topic because he has published extensively in virtue ethics and its application to law and judging. Prior to joining UVA, Professor Solom was a member of the faculty at the George, Georgetown University Law Center, the University of Illinois, the University of San Diego, and Loyola Marymount University. And he has visited at Boston University and the University of Southern California. Professor Solom practiced law at Cravath, Swain and Moore, clerked for Judge William A. Norris on the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He received his law degree from Harvard Law School and his undergraduate degree from the University of California at Los Angeles. So, Professor Solomon. Thank you, Joel. So, thanks so much uh, uh, for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My first time speaking uh, or, or doing anything really at uh, Catholic, uh, so uh, it's a real pleasure. So, I'm going to be talking about <coughs> the judicial virtues, and I want to start with Aristotle. So uh, Aristotle's moral philosophy uh, uh, has many starting points, but one of those is the idea of eudaimonia, or human flourishing, faring well and doing well. Uh, Aristotle thought that eudaimonia, that flourishing was the highest humanly achievable good. And he thought that to understand what flourishing was for humans, we needed uh, to have an understanding of human nature. And Aristotle believed that humans were social and rational creatures. So, uh, what is it to live a flourishing human life? It is to live a life that involves social and rational activities, which could be of many kinds. Uh, and living a flourishing life requires that we uh, sort of have the material prerequisites for flourishing. So we, we need to have the things like peace, and prosperity that enable us to good lives. But for Aristotle, it was key that uh, humans possess the kinds of excellences or virtues that are appropriate to humans. And he divided these virtues into two categories, although maybe there were three categories. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the moral virtues. So the moral virtues for Aristotle are dispositional states in relationship to morally neutral emotions. So uh, one of these virtues is courage. Uh, 
Courage relates to an emotion, fear, and Aristotle thought that there was a vice of excess. We call this an anger management problem. But there's also a vice of deficiency. The vice of deficiency uh, is the failure to respond with appropriate anger when injustice is done. Because anger is the moral emotion that uh, responds to injustice. And likewise, uh, uh, there are other virtues. There's, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, I was talking about fear and I switched to anger, you'll excuse me. Uh, uh, Aristotle thought that uh, courage uh, and good temper uh, and other such traits were human virtues. We needed these virtues to flourish. And then he believed that there were intellectual virtues, and two of these are Sophia, or theoretical wisdom, and phrenesis, or practical wisdom. So theoretical wisdom, we're familiar with this uh, in law, right? Because we have to understand complex complicated stuff. Uh, and phrenesis, or practical wisdom, uh, is a little more complex. So Aristotle's idea of practical wisdom can be understood on the model of a perceptual capacity. It's like an ability to see what is morally salient and to recognize the possibilities that are practical. So a, a virtuous human has all of those characteristics and another virtue uh, as well. And that virtue is justice. So uh, Aristotle on justice is really, really uh, 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 something that philosophers have struggled to understand. Uh, but I think that there's a very good account of Aristotle on the virtue of justice uh, on offer uh, in Aristotle himself, in the Nicomachean Ethics, and in the work of a, a, a moral philosopher uh, who does uh, Aristotle, uh, Richard Kraut. And here is the idea. The virtue of justice uh, is not a virtue that says, form your own beliefs about uh, how things ought to be, and then act uh, in accord with those beliefs. That's a possible understanding of the virtue of justice, but that's not how Aristotle saw it. Aristotle thought that there was an internal connection between the virtue of justice and the idea of lawfulness. Only for Aristotle, lawfulness was a slightly different concept than would be suggested by modern thinking about lawfulness. Though the Greek word, nomos, that is translated as law, uh, uh, had a more capacious meaning than law in sort of the positive law sense that uh, prevails in American legal culture. So for Aristotle, the nomoi were inclusive of social norms and customs that are widely shared in a particular community and deeply held. So to be lawful meant to internalize the social norms of your community, the customs of your community. They, they became yours, and so you become a lawful human, a human who is able to interact with others uh, in a way that is connected to the social norms that govern human interaction 
in your community. To be just is to be lawful. But that's not the end of the matter. Aristotle believed that uh, uh, there was an aspect of justice that was connected in a deep way to the idea of phrenesis, of practical wisdom. And this idea, uh, epiakia in uh, Greek, uh, is translated uh, uh, as equity. So uh, a fully virtuous human is not just lawful, they also have the ability to understand the ways in which uh, the particularity of human experience, the infinite variety of human life, cannot be fully captured in any system of rules. But in order to do that, you be, you've got to be able to pick out what the purpose of a rule is and to understand particular fact situations, as we would say it in law, and how they relate to those purposes. So those are Aristotle's virtues. Aristotle thought that a life of human flourishing was a life in which you would be able to pursue social and rational activities that express the human excellences. Okay, now what does all this have to do with judging? What are the judicial virtues? So uh, I want to just begin with what we might call a thin theory of the judicial virtues. These are the virtues that we can all agree uh, a good judge needs. So a good judge has to have what Aristotle calls the moral virtues. If a judge is a coward, if he can be or she can be intimidated, uh, then that will undermine their ability to be a reliably good judge. If uh, a judge has an anger management problem, that's going to be uh, a difficulty for the courtroom. Uh, uh, won't be able to be a good judge. If a judge lacks theoretical wisdom, if a judge can't understand the law, then you can't be a good judge. And, and, and so we can, all, we can all sort of agree that these characteristics that Aristotle thought were the virtues of all humans are also uh, virtues for judges. But uh, uh, the virtues of Phrenesis, practical wisdom, and the virtue of justice are obviously particularly important for judges. So to be an excellent judge, you need to be lawful, right? And so this means that you need to uh, uh, have internalized the nomoi. You need to have internalized the social norms that characterize your community. And you need to be practically wise. It's not enough to be theoretically wise. And we all kind of know this. Uh, I think the people in the front of the room, Joel and Jabal and I, know that uh, it's not enough to understand the law intellectually, that even uh, the most sophisticated intellect can just get the law badly wrong because they don't really understand its purposes. They don't understand how to make it work under real conditions. So uh, a really excellent judge needs to be practically wise and lawful. Now, 
I just want to then say that we need to understand that a virtue theoretic account of good judging gives us sort of a, a handle on uh, sort of two dangers for judges. So uh, here's the first danger. Uh, judges who lack the virtue of lawfulness uh, can become tyrants. They can impose their own will, that is, their own view of what the law ought to be uh, on, on, their, on their fellows. And that's, that's a problem. Judges who are tyrants, who view the law as the instrument to achieve their own vision of how society should be, that's very problematic. But, but there's another danger for judges, and when one, one might put it this way, you could be too lawful. That is, you can fail to appreciate that laws have purposes and that to understand how to apply the law requires practical wisdom. It requires that you appreciate the purpose of the rules and that you recognize the situations where although the literal meaning of the rule would cover the situation, uh, uh, the purpose does not. That is, you need uh, the corrective to justice as lawfulness, which is equity. So a fully virtuous judge, a judge with all the virtues, with the moral and intellectual virtues, uh, provides us with the standard, the measuring stick for how the law should go. And that is characteristic of virtue ethics, that virtue ethics makes the phronomos, the fully virtuous human with all of the virtues, including this crucial virtue of practical wisdom, the measuring stick, the standard by which we judge human conduct. And likewise, a virtue theoretical approach to the law makes the virtuous judge, the fully virtuous judge, uh, the standard for legal correctness. And I'm going to just stop there, and I'm really looking forward to uh, Jamal's remarks. Well, thank you, Professor Solom. Jamal Green is the Dwight Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. His scholarship focuses on constitutional law, especially the structure of legal and constitutional argument. And his work has appeared in places like Harvard Law Review, Yale Law Journal, and Columbia Law Review. And he very recently published a book, How Rights Went Wrong, Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart. As relevant to this event, I would especially commend to you his article, Pathetic Argument in Constitutional Law, published in the Columbia Law Review, uh, which focuses in part on the interaction of uh, emotion, legal argument, and I think has real implications for uh, virtue th uh, ethics as well. Uh, prior to joining Columbia, Professor Green was the Alexander Fellow at New York University School of Law. He's been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School and served as Columbia Law's Vice Dean for Intellectual Life. He served, a, served as a law clerk to Justice John Paul Stevens on the U.S. Supreme Court and to Judge Guido Calabresi on the U.S. Qu uh, Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. He received his law degree from Yale Law School, his undergraduate degree from Harvard. So, Professor Green. Thank you. It's, uh, it's really nice to be here. It's nice to be invited. This is the first time I've been uh, at this uh, university or at this law school, so um, uh, it's, uh, it's a, it was a welcome uh, invitation for me. I'm going to uh, start by just making a couple of, uh, of points, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually interested in the questions and interested in your questions as well. Uh, the first point I'll, I'll just start with, and I'm going to sit. Uh, I'm not quite as dynamic as uh, my colleague. Um, uh, the first point I'll, I'll make is just uh, that I'm not, uh, I don't think of myself as, and I'm, I'm not, uh, an expert in uh, virtue ethics. Uh, I'm not uh, a legal philosopher. Uh, I am not uh, an expert on Aristotle or an expert on 
uh, on, on Catholic intellectual uh, thought. Um, but uh, I am uh, trained as a lawyer, uh, and so I'll talk about things anyway, <laughs> um, as if I have expertise. Um, that's what we uh, tr are trained to do. Um, but the second, um, the second point uh, I'll make is that we are, I think, in a moment in our country uh, and uh, within the, especially, especially the constitutional law, but I'll broaden it to saying the public law of our country, uh, where uh, I think judicial virtue is a ripe uh, topic for discussion, uh, not least because the courts uh, and the Supreme Court in particular uh, find themselves facing uh, a legitimacy crisis. Uh, and I, I say that you know, with, with due respect to Justice Alito, um, who has pushed back on that characterization, regardless of whether one um, thinks the characterization is justified. Um, as a social fact, it is, it is the case. Um, uh, and it is born out of a perception that uh, the courts and the pr Supreme Court in particular is the subject of a certain kind of partisan capture, um, at least when it decides um, certain kinds of public law cases and constitutional law cases in particular. Uh, now, obviously, um, partisanship in the kind of political partisanship um, sense uh, is, not, uh, is not a judicial uh, virtue. Um, uh, and I don't think one needs to belabor that for very long. Um, but I think it is worth asking, and of course people disagree about the degree to which um, we're, well, that's what we're seeing, uh, but I think it's worth asking whether there may be less obvious uh, virtues or vices that are especially important in the U.S. constitutional context and especially important uh, in this moment uh, in U.S. constitutional law. And I think I want to suggest, and I'm not sure how I feel about this, but I think I want to suggest that what counts uh, as a virtuous judge in constitutional law, and here I mean US constitutional law in particular, uh, might not be quite the same as what counts as a virtuous judge in uh, other legal contexts, uh, let's, say, let's say private law, or the decision about you know, who owns Blackacre, uh, for example. Um, and I want to ultimately say that um, uh, or at least the thing I want to focus on ultimately, the virtue I want to focus on ultimately, is the virtue of humil humility uh, and its associated vice, vice of, uh, of self-certainty, uh, which I, th I think may, be, um, may play out somewhat differently in the constitutional context than in other contexts. Uh, to get there, I want to start with um, three propositions about um, constitutional judging in the United States. Um, and one I'll spend a little bit more time on than others because one of them I think is, is less familiar and is less commonly discussed uh, than others. Uh, and the, the, the first, and, so that, and that's the first proposition. So um, the, first, the first proposition I want to uh, suggest is that uh, there are serious questions of, uh, of, uh, of legitimacy and authority uh, around the original design and the formal amendments of the U.S. Constitution. Um, we often speak of the Constitution, uh, both in, in court and out of court, as if it uh, represents, in its original design and in its um, significant amendments, a set of powerful commitments uh, that reflect the will of the American people, uh, of we the people, and that is why we must um, constrain modern politics uh, by those commitments because they are the deep commitments that we have made as, uh, as a people. Um, the problem is that that's not true. <laughs> um, uh, that's not um, defensible, um, at least as applied to the original Constitution. The Constitution was not drafted by a majority of the American people or ratified by people representing them. It was drafted by uh, people who did not uh, permit women to participate in electoral politics uh, and at times uh, practiced uh, human slavery um, and who by and large conditioned the vote on freeholding, on owning property. The Constitution was of course ratified in a very close vote um, by bodies uh, whose members were selected uh, under similarly discriminatory conditions. Um, to say that a document that um, 
such openly exclusionary bodies drafted and ratified uh, represents uh, ipso facto the will of the people um, is not just wrong, but is frankly offensive. Now, of course, the Constitution has changed um, since 1787 in lots of ways. Um, but as to the significant provisions drafted after 1787, there are similar problems. Right? The 14th Amendment, which is considered um, by many to be the grand corrective of the original Constitution, was drafted by a Congress of exclusively white men. Um, women, uh, again, could not participate in electoral politics. And in most states at the time, including uh, in the North and the West of the country, um, blacks could not uh, participate in politics on equal terms with whites. Now, it, it may well be that the language of the 14th Amendment, the language and the language of original constitutional provisions, um, represented a genuine commitment of we the people uh, in some sense. Um, but the process through which that language made it into the Constitution can't give us very much uh, confidence that that's right. We, we just don't know. And I, I recount this history, which is not, uh, should, should be well known, um, not to take shots at the framers, um, many of whom had attitudes about republicanism that were ahead of their time. Uh, but I recount this history to suggest that the reverence that we as Americans owe the Constitution today um, can't rest on its status as an exercise of popular sovereignty, at least not as, not as originally designed. It was not such an exercise uh, unless we think that those acts of mass exclusion were justified. Um, and as you can imagine, right, for someone who looks like me, uh, the, the claim that the Constitution represents some high democratic commitment um, is especially alienating. Now, um, so the question becomes, what do we do about the fact, or how do we posture ourselves towards the fact that the Constitution was drafted and supported by a distinct minority of the population? Um, that distinct minority then put in the amendment rules that prevent even motivated majorities from changing the Constitution. And so given that, the authority and legitimacy of the Constitution as written, um, if such authority and legitimacy in fact exist, um, needs to be, it's something that has to be actively argued and defended, right? It can't be simply assumed. Um, the process through which it was drafted and ratified don't permit that assumption. And the substance of that defense, the substance of the defense of the authority and legitimacy of the Constitution as written, is not obvious. <clears throat> Um, the key point, then, is that constitutional law debates in the United States are not debates between, by and large, between those who honor the deep commitments of the American people embodied in the Constitution versus those who don't uh, honor those deep commitments. There, by and large, are debates about what the deep commitments of the American people actually are. They're debates about who or what actually speaks for America, and this is a hard question, and it's a hard question because genuine, actual, diverse majorities of Americans have never codified the answer to the question of, at least not constitutionally codified, the answer to the question of what their deep commitments uh, are. It doesn't mean that we don't have any deep commitments as a people, um, but it does mean that um, we, the people, have never actually written them down in a constitution. Right, so that's proposition number one, which is that the legitimate materials of constitutional law, which include our deep commitments, they don't just include the written constitution, but also uh, unwritten elements of, of, of our legal tradition, uh, are themselves ambiguous. Right? So these are ambiguous legal materials. The second proposition is a, is a familiar point, a more familiar point, I think, which is that um, even if the legitimate materials of constitutional law were clear, as in we know what they are, um, many of the standards that we spend a lot of time arguing about in constitutional law uh, are, do not give uh, clear instructions. As Chief Justice Marshall said in McCulloch versus Maryland, the Constitution lacks the prolixity of a legal code. Um, it is not um, written, um, as many modern constitutions are, some anyway, um, it's not written with great specificity about precisely what rights people have and what rights uh, they don't have. 
Um, again, this is not a general feature of constitutions, uh, even though Marshall seemed to suggest that it was. Uh, but it is a feature of our constitution, which is, um, depending on how one counts, either the second or the fifth or the sixth or something, um, shortest constitution uh, in the world. Um, it doesn't get amended for reasons I described, uh, and it's not very specific. So when we talk about things like equal protection of the laws and um, abridging the freedom of speech um, and uh, due process and liberty and so forth, uh, these are not self-explanatory terms. Uh, and uh, uh, it's fair to suggest, I think, um, although Larry might disagree with this, that they're essentially contested. Um, at least many of them are. The third proposition, so one is that the legal materials are, it's unclear what the right legal materials are, because it's unclear what we've actually committed to. The second is that even if we assume that, the, that we've got the right materials, they are themselves quite vague um, and incorporate essentially contested ideas. And the third proposition is that uh, judges are not philosophers or academics. And this is obvious as far as it goes, but I think the implications of that fact are not, um, are not sufficiently uh, discussed. Uh, the courts uh, are um, agents of the state, right? They exercise a coercive power uh, over people in order to resolve political disputes. Um, and when I say political disputes, I don't mean about tax policy or whatever. I mean disputes that um, involve uh, a political disagreement uh, about various things. This is, of course, not unique to the US uh, Constitution, uh, but I think it is relevant um, to um, how we think about what makes a virtuous judge. Um, again, their job is not to resolve abstract legal questions. Uh, their job is to resolve conflicts between people and to do so in ways that invoke the, the violence of the state um, as their backup, right? So these are state institutions, right? So if all that's right, then I think the role of judges and the character that one should seek in a judge within this particular context, the context of constitutional law, um, is maybe more ambiguous than we might have imagined. It's natural, I think, if all the things that I've said are true, it's natural to ask why give judges these kinds of powers at all if we're talking about um, exercising coercive political power um, and the underlying norms that they need to apply are essentially contested, right? Why, why have um, judges do this work at all? Why replicate political contestation via some unaccountable um, act, actor or unaccountable institution? This is a really important question, but here's what, where I think the, the virtue of humility uh, comes in. If we're going to use judges in constitutional law and not just resolve these, these, these disputes through um, other forms of politics, then it means we believe in the law politics distinction. We believe that there's something that judges are doing that other kinds of actors are, are not doing. Uh, but uh, we don't, I'm, I, I think, um, we don't necessarily reify the law politics distinction by invoking different norms equality versus equal protection of the laws, right? So politicians can talk about equality, but judges must stick to the, the language of the Constitution, which is equal protection of the laws. Um, the perception that this distinction is not um, conceptually interesting, right? That judges who are trying to figure out, okay, so does equal protection of the laws require that the state not engage in race-based affirmative action? Or does it require that they do? That the, precisely the opposite. Um, does it necessitate race-based affirmative action? That's not a question that um, the legal materials provide any clear answer to in traditionally legal terms, calling it equal protection of the laws rather than um, some kind of moralizing about equality doesn't change um, what, the, uh, what the task is. And so the way to reify the distinction, the law politics distinction, is by um, having different kinds of decision makers with different levels of tenure protection and with different kinds of, social, of socialization, decide certain kinds of questions. I think, in effect, to lower the temperature of politics. That's where I think judges um, are doing, are at their best. So what makes for a virtuous judge under those conditions uh, is um, ultimately 
a recognition of the plurality of sources of value when it comes to constitutional law, um, recognition of the genuine pluralism of the nation, right? This is the most significant and underappreciated difference between 2022 and the founding is that um, we are a genuinely pluralistic nation with lots and lots of different visions of the good and, and uh, we have an underlying ethos that understands those people, um, all of those people to count. Um, and that's going to produce all kinds of conflict um, that has to be managed by state institutions uh, and not simply um, uh, um, uh, not managed um, hierarchically. So there's got to be a recognition uh, on the part of a judge in these circumstances of genuine pluralism. Uh, again, it's offensive uh, to suggest that momentous political questions today that we, the diverse people that we are, disagree about should be decided on the basis of minoritarian views that excluded others on the basis of their race and their sex. Um, this is, I think, a question of virtue um, and not just a, not a question, not a deontological question or a question of consequences. Now, I'll, I'll just make one um, other point, which is that um, recognition of the importance of pluralism in constitutional law requires going back to this virtue of humility, uh, a certain kind of posture, a certain kind of temperament towards the kinds of commitments that um, get, that deserve judicial recognition, so rights, um, for example, um, but also requires acknowledgement of the competing um, presence of other commitments. Um, so there are a lot of different competing commitments. We don't have a very good way of deciding which of those commitments are the ones that matter more than others. Uh, and those decisions have consequences for how people, how much people feel recognized by um, constitutional adjudicators. And so um, it requires, I'll use the term that Robert Alexi, the constitutional, German constitutional theorist uses, optimization of a variety of different values rather than maximizing one or the other. Um, requires uh, a certain uh, uh, it requires a drawing on, um, on practices of mediation, which is to say part of the job is to enable um, peaceful collective self-governance, um, not just to award winners and losers uh, within legal uh, disputes. And so this is maybe a little bit different uh, than, um, than who owns uh, Blackacre. Uh, and I think the ultimate um, lesson that I, that I want to suggest is that you know, we can't take politics out of public law. Um, and indeed, I think we should not take, we shouldn't try to take politics out of public law because public law is the way in which we govern ourselves. And so we have to govern ourselves through politics. Um, but we can use law and use judges um, in the service of effective constitutional governance. Uh, and uh, doing so uh, requires um, certain habits of mind that uh, I associate um, with the idea of virtue. Thank you. Well, I, I have plenty of questions. I'm sure the, the audience does as well, but I wanted to just quickly, uh, Professor Solom, if, if, if there was anything you wanted to say in response to Professor Green, and, and if he wanted to respond, I wanted to give you a chance uh, before I dive into questions. But if not, I can just dive right in. I, I, I'd love to hear your questions okay. Okay. and the audience's questions Very well. as well. Uh, I want to pick up on uh, one of the themes of Professor Green's uh, remarks, especially towards the end there, this point about uh, pluralism, this, uh, what, what Rawls would call this fact of reasonable pluralism in a liberal society, this per persistent disagreement among people in a free society, uh, and what implications that has for politics and for law. Uh, I think Professor Green uh, touched upon how central that is in thinking about constitutional uh, law. Uh, Professor Solomon, in your work, you've also pointed out that uh, perhaps uh, virtue jurisprudence could be a way, uh, uh, a different way of, a, of approaching persistent disagreements in legal theory uh, uh, that, that seem ir irresolvable in many ways. I want to, to ask whether, uh, as a ch potentially as a challenge to, both, to what both of you uh, have said, uh, is virtue theory or, or, or virtue 
uh, is, I, I'll just say, is, is uh, an approach to judging that is centered on virtue, as both of you, I think, were uh, uh, proposing in different ways. Um, is that actually a way past persistent disagreement, given that virtue requires some account of the good? We only know if someone's acting virtuously if we know what the good is, and, if, and that fact of reasonable pluralism, of, of, of dis persistent disagreement, extends precisely to that, to what is the good. And so if we have that persistent disagreement about what the good is, we're not going to agree on what the contours of virtues and are, including humility. So I was wondering what, what you would say in response to that, uh, that puzzle. So it's a, it's a deep puzzle. And I just want to start out by saying uh, we, the, the fact of pluralism, I think, is a fact. I, Jamal is just absolutely right about this. We live in a society where there is fundamental disagreement about basic questions, questions about the good uh, and questions about the nature of justice. And so uh, we need to be able to acknowledge that fact of pluralism. Uh, any, any approach uh, to the law, and, and I, I, I'm not limiting myself to constitutional law here, that fails to acknowledge this fact about our contemporary circumstances is just not going to be realistic. And it won't address the set of problems that we actually have. So now, um, does virtue theory provide us with resources to think about this question? Uh, if we think about virtuous judges and how uh, a judge equipped with the virtues would approach uh, the problem of disagreement um, uh, does that give us any insight, any, any way into this problem? And, and I think that, that it does. I, I just want to say that um, I agree uh, with Jamal that uh, humility or something like it, I might quibble about the word, but, but some, that something very much like this uh, is very important because um, under conditions of pluralism, what a virtuous judge won't do is substitute their own vision of the society they would like us to become uh, for uh, where the society is actually at. And in a pluralistic society, uh, that means that on many questions, uh, we're not going to agree on the substance. We're not going to agree on uh, reproductive uh, uh, autonomy versus uh, the right to life of the unborn. That, that's not something that is going to serve as the basis for agreement. And so uh, a virtuous judge is going to have to try to look for a way to address these deep and persistent disagreements that'll work. Uh, and uh, that, I think, implies that we need to look beyond outcomes, beyond our preferred results in important cases, and think about processes. And so democratic legitimacy, I agree, is absolutely a key value. And uh, it is a reason why courts ought to be respectful of decisions made through democratic processes. I think that that is right. I think the rule of law is a very important value that can serve as a basis for agreement uh, I think that the fact of, of pluralism, the fact of disagreement, counsels in favor of judges who have this virtue of lawfulness. I, you know, there's a lot of common ground here. I, Jamal talked a lot about originalism. I'm an originalist, and of course, it's very hard to restrain myself from not getting into a debate about originalism, but that's not why we're here. 
That, that's an important topic, but it's not why we're here in my view. We're here to think about whether the concept of virtue might help us make some prog progress. And, and I'd, I'd like to suggest that it might. So I'll, I'll just say a little bit in response, uh, or in response to the, to the question, um, which I take to be a, a kind of, um, you know, do you have a kind of infinite regress <laughs> problem, um, you know, if we, if we fundamentally and, and constitutively disagree, then we can't agree on what virtue requires, and so it can't be helpful here. Um, and that may be right at some, at some level, but it, it, I'm, I'm not a nihilist, and so you've got to start somewhere um, and, um, uh, and, you know, ultimately try to persuade people that there, is, um, that there are ways of making progress. Uh, I'll go back to um, my third proposition, right, which is that judges are agents of the state um, and are not just um, not just theorists or, or, or academics, uh, and say that if they were just theorists or academics, then we might we might be able we might just have to rest on you know we can't we just can't overcome our disagreements and so what are we going to do about that? But the fact that they are engaged in politics. Um, and, and or as as um, as state institutions means that they can understand their role not necessarily as having to resolve the disagreement, but as having to manage the disagreement, which is to say to um, to engage in politics, um, which I, I'll say not as a pejorative, but um, politics as managing disagreement in peaceful ways. Um, and um, I'll, I'll in fact use the the example of reproductive autonomy as, a, as an example of this. Because um, what is interesting about this particular um, topic is, yes, of course, it is, it is the case that because we're going to disagree as a people about, um, about how far reproductive autonomy goes, how to think about uh, the rights of, uh, of the unborn, uh, and how those relate to each other. Um, but it is also the case that in most countries in the world, this is not a source of persistent and existential political conflict. Um, it, it, there are ways of um, reaching, maybe not in the US today, maybe we're too far down, the, down this road, but um, around the world, there, there are political equilibria. <laughs> um, those political equilibria don't eliminate disagreement. Um, people still disagree. But they recognize that they live in a society with others um, who may not be of, of like mind. And they use the modes of politics to figure out ways of, of having a relatively stable consensus around, uh, around even this very difficult and controversial topic. And I think, and part of my, the book that uh, Professor uh, Alisea mentioned, uh, How Rights Went Wrong, is really uh, about how judges can participate in the process of reaching that kind of political equilibrium without sacrificing their role as being judges rather than politicians or, or other kinds of of actors. Um, so uh, I, I think it's very important um, to, and, and, I, I, do and I, again, I, I do think it implicates questions of virtue in this context for um, judges to, to constantly understand themselves as um, institutions of management of conflict um, and not of resolution of disagreement, because I don't think that that's um, something that can be done in this context. I'll just have one more question, and then we'll throw it open to the, the audience. The, to, if we're going to accept a virtue-centered uh, idea of judging, I would think that one of those virtues that we would think judges should have is the virtue of justice, which Professor Solom really focused on in his uh, remarks. But we can't have a virtue of justice unless we know what is due right, to the two people, since that's what justice is. It's giving teach what is their due. Uh, and that means that there is some relationship between, we need some account of the relationship between justice and law, which again, Professor Solom, you picked up on quite a bit in your uh, remarks. Uh, so I wonder if a virtue-centered uh, account of judging necessarily has implications for how we think about the nature of law, and it has implications for jurisprudential debates about legal positivism, natural law, the, the, what, what law is. Uh, because it seems like some sort of virtue-centered account of judging requires some understanding of what law is in order to understand what the virtue of justice is. 
Well, thank you. Uh, that, of course, this, is, this question is dear and dear to my heart. So, um, yes. So the virtue of justice understood as lawfulness exactly addresses the question about the nature of law. Um, if uh, to be a just human means uh, to be a lawful human, and if by law we have an understanding that the foundation of law is not enactment, enactments uh, uh, have legal status because they are recognized by an underlying system of social norms or customs. So, so the way a statute acquires the status of law is uh, by its relationship to a set of social norms that recognize the authority of the legislature. Uh, and that authority is not uh, unlimited. Uh, an enactment that um, uh, departs too far from the underlying system of social norms, it, it won't get uptake. It won't be the law in action because uh, 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 the, the, the members of society won't treat it as such. And of course, we're all too familiar with laws uh, that, that, that don't work because they depart uh, from the underlying system of social norms. There's another point, it's just very important, and I haven't talked about it yet, so let me just say one thing about it. Um, for it to be a law, it's not enough that a lot of people um, accept it either as an enactment pursuant to a socially recognized authority, or that the, the norm itself and, and many laws, of course, directly reflect underlying social norms as accepted by a lot of people. To be a law, it needs to bear the right relationship to human flourishing, right? So uh, that's an important part of the picture. Uh, and it, that part of the picture is so hard in our society because of pluralism, because of disagreements about what a flourishing human life is. And, and I, 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 I'm not sure I agree with the idea that judges should see themselves as mediators, but I do think that judges need to take into account the conflicts that, that Jamal identifies as uh, giving rise to the need for, for mediation. And so this is a particularly difficult problem, and this is why practical wisdom is so important why judges who lack this virtue, the, the virtue of being able to see what's truly valuable and what's workable under, fa under the factual conditions we actually face, this is why you just can't be a good judge without this characteristic. And I just will say, I think we have a lot of very bad judges who lack practical wisdom. And I think one of the reasons why this is true is because of these deep value conflicts which have led political actors to try to conquer the judicial system by appointing judges who will vote political preferences uh, and uh, not do the job that judges need to do. So I, I just think that this is, we, we have a really big problem and, and in this I'm in total agreement with Jamal. Well, that's always a nice place to end, um, <laughs> uh, with total agreement with Jamal. But um, I'll, uh, I'll just say something very, very brief um, to, to add to this, and par partly brief because this is not a question that speaks to me um, in a deep sense, in the sense that I don't have and have never been able to develop strong opinions about the nature of law. Um, I, I, I am interested in judicial behavior. I'm interested in adjudication. I'm interested in the resolution of uh, political conflict, conflict through courts. Uh, and I don't think that, um, I, I, I haven't arrived at the, at least I haven't taken the position that, um, that any of my views depends on 
a position about the nature of law. Uh, what I will say is that, um, is that, and I'll just refer back um, to uh, some of my prior, this feels like a very long time ago work, this article that was mentioned earlier, uh, pathetic argument in constitutional law, one of the points of which was that um, it, it, the, the article was about the, the appeals to emotion um, in constitutional judging. And the, one of the underlying arguments is we see this all the time um, in practice, even though um, there are kind of standard accounts that say you're not supposed to do this. Um, and uh, I think precisely because the, legitim the legitimacy of at least constitutional law re relies on a certain degree of acceptance, social acceptance of what judges are doing and how they're connecting what they're doing to, um, to um, social norms. Part of the job of the judge is, involves um, persuasion. Um, part of the job of the judge is to um, make people believe that the things that they say are right. Uh, there are systems in which the way in which judicial opinions are written suggests that judges don't understand themselves to have that, you know, t to take a typical um, civil law, um, uh, uh, a, a judicial decision where the law really is, really does have the prolixity of a legal code. Well, there, our job is just to tell you what's in the legal code and then you believe it. Um, we don't um, think of our higher law in that way. And because we don't think of, at least in part, because we don't think of our higher law in that way, we also write opinions differently uh, and we appeal to certain kinds of, of resources, including um, people's emotions. I do want to make sure we get in at least one question. So uh, any questions from the audience before we conclude? Professor Walsh, our, 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 my co-director uh, for, for CIT. Thank you for this. And um, just a, a question, what about the virtue of obedience um, for a judge? Um, I recently, I was talking with a, a colleague um, at another school and he said, I'm not sure that that is as helpful, right? So contrast obedience with humility, right? If the way that law works as it is, is to be backward looking so that we said there was some type of settlement in the past that was intended to be looked to in the future to resolve problems. It seemed obedience, right? To, uh, sort of um, looking to someone else's will, uh, a will other than the judge, and precisely as an aspect of justice, um, might be, might give us some, some purchase um, over humility. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> and, and maybe it's because it's easier to argue about what counts as obedience um, rather than what counts as a, a humble decision. You know, take, take Dobbs, right, one that we're all familiar with. Which was the most humble decision uh, there? Uh, there was one that invoked humility uh, uh, more than the others. Um, is that an easier or harder question than which was the most obedient? And I understand that obedience, we're then going to replicate, we're going to go back to law, right? <laughs> what, what is it? Um, but I just thought I'd sort of invite reflection on the, whether it's useful to argue about obedience rather than um, humility. So I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to start, and I, I guess I'll, the first thing I'll say is that uh, I, I don't, I, I may have to think about it more, but I, I, I do think my sense is that obedience is a judicial virtue um, in the sense that you describe, which is to say um, judges um, should not be substituting their will for the command of whatever, um, whatever, the, whatever the law is. Uh, I think in a lot of contexts, including the context in which uh, I, the fields I labor in, uh, that 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 just ends up being question begging, right? Because um, we disagree about what obedience to the law requires, uh, and that I think I think both sides and. Uh, Dobbs would say that they were being both obedient and humble. Um, all, I should say all three sides, right? If you, if we, uh, I think Just, Chief Justice Roberts is the opinion that invoked humility directly, um, uh, and uh, and they would all say, you know, we're being humble to precedent we're, and obeying what we think the law is versus 
to the democratic will and what we think the Constitution is um, to a certain judicial role. And, and, and so I, I don't know how much, I don't know how much, um, how much progress we, we can make. Um, I, I, I kept, I, I, throughout this conversation, I've kept thinking about um, my favorite quote from Ronald Dworkin uh, in his written work, which, is, which was from a, and Larry will be familiar with, with this, but it was from, I think it was from a, a, a Fordham symposium, um, uh, maybe on his work. <laughs> it was. Uh, where he said, uh, you know, he said, or maybe or he might, he, I don't, or he, he may have mentioned this in, in, um, in, in one of his books as well. Uh, but you know, he, was, he said, people keep asking me, why is it that um, all, of, all of your, you know, your you've, you've elaborated this very, um, uh, this very comprehensive constitutional theory, but, but it, it, all you see is happy endings. Uh, it, it all just lines up with you know, Ronald Dworkin's conception of the good. Isn't that a problem? And he says, well, you know, the, uh, of course I aim for happy endings. The only alternative is to aim for unhappy, uh, unhappy endings. Um, which is a way of saying not that, uh, well, first he said, well, of course, of course, I, 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 it doesn't all line up with all of my views, right? But, but, which is, but it's to say that when we talk about certain kinds of legal materials, that um, of, of course, at some level, you're aiming for something that allows the system to work, right, in some way. Uh, that, that's a, that those consequences are part of the, um, are part of the uh, the uh, 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 a part of the the value that a, a judge sees in what they're doing, uh, and so you, you can't escape that at some level. You can't escape some degree of judgment, and judgment is always going to be exercised by people with discretion in the direction of things that they think are good, as opposed to things that they think are bad, and it and it becomes very hard to unpack um, uh, where their where their discretion is being used in an improper um, way. Anything you want to add, Professor Sewell? There's so much, so much rich stuff there. Um, so uh, I think I just want to say this, that um, I, I think Dworkin was fundamentally wrong when he emphasized happy endings, right? So, so Dworkin's theory is that the judge is very much a moral philosopher uh, who answers the deep questions. Uh, what's the best ideal of equality? What's the best theory of the human good? Uh, what, what is procedural fairness? What powers should the national government have? Uh, and his theory is that, we, that, that the judge should aim for the ending that the judge thinks is happy. Right now, I'm I'm exaggerating because he's got this whole thing about fit and justification, and it's the moral theory that justifies best justifies the law as a whole that the judge should follow. But but the happy ending point really captures what he's up to. So we do not live in a world of happy endings. We live in a world where our society is deeply divided. And if we're going to get along with each other, then uh, we're not, that, then my happy endings can't all be realized. That's, that's just not possible. I have a view of how the good society would work, but, but in a pluralist society, and especially in a pluralist society characterized by the sort of deep divisions that we're experiencing at the current moment, we need to recognize the tragic nature of constitutional choices. Uh, if we're going to get along, if we're going to be able to mediate these deep conflicts, that means that all of us are going to have to sacrifice things of great value. That's that's the world in which we live. So I, I just think Dworkin got it completely wrong. The, the, the judge does not aim at the endings the judge thinks are most happy. The judge has to aim at endings that are possible in a world that is deeply divided. And, though, and that means lots of things have to be considered. 
but one of those things has to be the law. And the law is not the same thing as obedience. Obedience is not a virtue. The, 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 the disposition to obey commands is not a virtue. Lawfulness is the virtue. Lawfulness is constitutively related to the social norms, customs, and positive enactments recognized by those social norms in the society. So yes, there is, in a sense, obedience, but it's obedience to the law, not obedience to other humans. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.